Okay, hello everyone. Uh, I am today with a very special guest, and uh, we are going to start a new series. Uh, this is one of the many series uh, going to be covering on astrophotography and astronomy in general. Uh, so there is a very uh, budding uh, com community in India, which we fondly call it as API uh, Astrophotography India, and um, one of the main contributors and uh, a very active member is uh, Shivam Bansal. So oh, we'll welcome hi. Shivam Bansal. Mm, hi. So, yes. So let's uh, get started. Uh, first of all, Shivam, you can just introduce yourself. How long have you been doing astrophotography, and what are uh, the uh, like main things that attracted you to astrophotography? Yeah. So I've uh, been doing astrophotography since uh, 2016, actually. Uh, but last year, in two, uh, 2020, in the pandemic, I started uh, seriously. Before that, I've had an interest in astronomy since I was uh, very young, like uh, nine, ten years old. I've read a lot of astronomy books, watched, watched a lot of documentaries. But uh, I, I also had a telescope when I was very small, but I didn't know how to use it properly. And uh, when I was sixteen years old, I uh, bought another telescope, and by that time, I know I learned how to use it, and I saw uh, the rings of Saturn and Jupiter, and I was really surprised and impressed. The, we, we could actually see the planets like they were in books, we could actually see them with our naked eyes. So that really sparked my interest in astronomy and I did visual astronomy for a few years, like uh, two, three years. And then I started doing photo astrophotography also. Okay. Uh, as, for, yeah. as for photography, I've been doing since around 2013 when I got my first DSLR camera. Uh, but I've done mostly wildlife and uh, it's a bit tough. Like I. I shot the moon, but that was just about it because I didn't know the proper settings to shoot more yes. objects. So first was visual uh, photography and then astrophotography. Yeah. But, so uh, we, the we, learning curve for astrophotography is much larger. You might be saying like, it's yeah, always yeah. better to get started with a normal yeah. photography first. Yeah. Yeah. Normal photography is uh, important because you need, you, you need to learn how to use your camera in manual mode like uh, the focal length, ISO and exposure times, all these settings you have to figure out. Like if you just set it to automatic, then you won't be able to uh, capture anything in the night sky because camera is not mostly designed for that. And uh, as for visual astronomy is also very important. Like you need to learn about the night sky, like which star, which star is visible in which uh, season, which are the famous objects like Orion, Nebula, Pleiades. Uh, those objects are, uh, are the easiest to start with and I think Visually seeing them with your eye and seeing a planet will help you learn about the night sky and then you can think about photography. Yes. Yeah. So you can tell me yeah. about uh, the telescope that you use and the object yeah. that you tried to capture. So this was in 2016 when I got my first uh, big telescope. It was a Nexstar 8 SE, which is an 8 inch telescope. And it was my first go to telescope, which means it's an automatic telescope. So you can enter the object you want to see and it just moves the telescope with motors and clues to that object. So this is the Orion Nebula, which I took my camera to a telescope and I took a few exposures to get this image. So you can see there are many things wrong with this image, like there is a lot of color noise, like the space isn't properly black and the stars are a bit cone shaped because the tracking wasn't perfect and there was some uh, distortion in my uh, telescope because I hadn't aligned the optics properly. But still you can see the trapezium structure, which is the triangular, stru uh, triangular structure in the middle. And this was my first deep sky photo in which you could actually see color. So even though it's not uh, that great, I, it was a really good start for me. Yes. So um, like, um, w why did you choose this particular object to uh, see in the night sky? Yeah, this object is uh, one of the brightest nebulas and it's so bright that you can even see it with your naked eye from a light polluted city. Because okay. it, and it's easy to locate also the famous Orion constellation, you, you know, the three, three stars in the belt. It's just below the belt. So this yes. is part of Orion's sword. Oh, so that nice. is why I photographed this one. Okay. So coming up to the most, um, like the only man-made object in the sky. One, yeah. Like there are a lot of satellites, but uh, nothing done at the scale of uh, this object. Yeah. So the biggest you... and most, yeah, this is uh, the International Space Station, which is the biggest and most expensive uh, object in space. And, uh, I, it has been continuously occupied since 2000 for the last 21 years. And uh, I, uh, there were around 10 astronauts on board this when I photographed it this month. 
uh, including Yusaku Maeda, which is a Japanese billionaire who went for nine days yes. as a space tourist. And you can you can even see the dragon SpaceX dragon capsule on the bottom left of the image, the uh, small white circle. Yeah. White circle. Uh, no, this uh, one. yeah, this one, this one, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, so uh, that was, this is one of my best images of the space station. Like I, I saw it visually for the first time in I think 2017. Mm -hmm. uh, when I used an app and you can just search how to see the ISS and there are apps which can tell you when it's about to be visible uh, around evening or morning times. Yes. So you can go outside and see it like it's like a fast moving star which tracks across the sky like faster than a plane but it doesn't blink. So that's why you can know it's ISS. Okay. But uh, mm -hmm. this um, uh, space station moves really fast. So uh, yeah. like with the next image, uh, you can try and explain how fast did the space station move around a very well-known object, which is the sun. Yeah, yeah. so this is uh, called an International Space Station Transit of the Sun. So sometimes uh, around every few weeks, the, the, the space station passes right in front of the sun or the moon. And I use the website to calculate when it will happen. And I drove around 100 kilometers to a uh, highway to put myself in the exact position where it will happen. And this is a stacked image showing the path. Uh, the actual transit took around 0.8 seconds. So very fast because the sun is very small in the sky and the ISS moves really quickly over it. So I recorded a video actually, not a photo, and I extracted the frames of the video and uh, uh, made this image. So you can see the solar panels, the edge shape is visible a little bit and it moved from the top right to the bottom left. Yes. So, um, mm. first of all, uh, the app helped you a bit in finding out ideal location. Um, yeah, it, it, it shows the path over Google Maps. It lay, lays out a line that you have to be on this four kilometer line to see the transit. And also the time. Uh, yeah, time. Uh, you will miss out that few seconds. Yeah. And also they, it gives the exact time, like one one twenty eight point eleven eleven seconds, because even the seconds can be one or two seconds off depending on the orbit. So it keeps changing. Like if, if it's one week in advance prediction, it might change by a few minutes because the orbit keeps changing uh, of the ISS. So only a few minutes before the transit, you have to get the exact uh, transit time. And uh, like if uh, the app predicts perfectly and you plan out the journey, but suppose there are some clouds or rain. Yeah. So uh, like how is there any help or in like is does the community help or uh, is, like, uh, what is the solution if uh, we don't uh, have a the, good sky? The pro the thing is, there's no solution. So you just have to see. Like, it, I had to drive hundred kilometers, but uh, the place where I was, it was clear sky. So I thought that most probably it will be clear there also. But if it's very cloudy and raining, then I probably wouldn't have attempted because uh, it's always a thing. Like, it's a like for uh, for the solar eclipse, I traveled to Kurukshetra. It was a eight hour journey and I didn't know the next day will it, there be clouds or not but I had to risk it because it was such a big event and if you are traveling to another country to see an eclipse then it's even more risky because you might so, might uh, lose out on your whole trip. So uh, I, I don't know if the viewers have seen but the re most recent Matt Parker video was hmm. on uh, he went to see a eclipse that happens in the opposite direction and in it Antarctica. only happens in South yeah. Pole uh, or at the North Pole at the very poles. Hmm. Uh, mm. There is a weird geometry between sun and the earth, which makes this uh, possible. And mm -hmm. he went there on a cruise ship to see that eclipse and uh, there were just clouds. Yeah. So, uh, the Actually, it, huh? yeah, it, it was a daytime for a few seconds. It became night nighttime because of the mm -hmm. eclipse and then mm -hmm. again daytime. So that was the only proof that the eclipse mm -hmm. happened, but he couldn't mm -hmm. capture it. Yeah, that area is uh, very notorious for bad weather. It's, it's called the Drake Passage. It's between South America and Antarctica. And so that area, it's mostly cloudy and stormy. So it was going to be a tough, uh, tough ask to capture the total solar eclipse because most, most area, most of the time is cloudy. But yeah, it's a, it, it must have been still good to experience uh, it getting dark, but it, yes. it would have been much better if you could see the sun. Yes, exactly. Hmm. Okay, now this is what um, many Indians also like to observe is, uh, it is uh, it's an, solar yeah, annular, annular solar eclipse. Annular, annular solar eclipse and they are quite rare, I think, uh, once every yeah. few years. Yeah, actually, they happen once every three or four years, but uh, getting it near you is even more rare. So next time annular solar eclipse will be in India will be in 2032, okay. which is like 11 years from now. And this happened in 
This happened on summer solstice 2020, June 20, June 21. And I traveled to Kurukshetra for uh, to see this and luckily I got a clear sky. It was just slightly cloudy like in the left left middle image you can see a little bit of clouds. But other than that it was uh, mostly clear and there was a 98.6% coverage of the sun. So you can see the ring is very thin. Like sometimes there is a thicker ring in annular solar eclipses when there is like an 85% coverage or something. But this was almost a total. It was very close. Yes. And it was so close that it got slightly dark where I was. Uh, but it but it was still very bright. Like you couldn't see it with your naked eyes. The, even the thin ring is so bright that you can't see it with your naked eyes. But with the solar glasses and camera, you could see. So that was one of the most uh, rarest and most epic events I've seen yes. in person. So uh, there is a lot of uncertainty. First of three to mm. four years, it comes once every three to four years. Then yeah. also percentage of coverage might not be like 80%, 90%. Yeah, and location, location is Location also important. you have to travel. And lastly, there can be clouds. So Yeah, clouds. So like th three things, location... Uh, rarity and clouds Even you have to if you manage. are at the location you'll have to be running around to pick a place where there is no clouds or I don't yeah. know how it would work but uh, actually clouds if it's very rare that you can move around to avoid clouds if it, there's cloud it's cloud in like 100 kilometer radius okay. so it's just a matter of luck like yeah, it sometimes is. it can happen that there are clouds during the partial phase but when totality comes clouds clear away so that has also happened because this eclipse takes around three hours to complete from start to finish. Yes, so it might the moon be, object is closer, so yeah, it, yeah, it yeah, travel moon, a bit slower. Yeah, and moon orbits Earth once every 28 days, 28 to 29 days or so. So that's why it uh, moves across the sun from our perspective. This image, uh, which is yeah. of a uh, solar ring and really, uh, like it requires a lot of... Um, uh, knowledge about filters and so on to capture this precise image so a bit yeah. about that yeah so this image is uh, my first narrowband image of the sun so most of the sun images you will see by like amateur photographers it will be uh, through a white light filter which is a, like a silver foil and it's specially designed to view the sun but you don't get any surface detail you get little bit of sunspots but otherwise the sun appears plain yellow but I used a specialized filter called a Daystar, uh, so Daystar Quark, which is which a tel which is a filter that goes behind your telescope, and then you put your camera on it, and then I captured a lot of frames in like 656 nanometers hydrogen alpha wavelength. Okay. So that is ice wavelength uh, through which you can see the chromosphere of the sun, which is like the thin the topmost layer of the surface of the sun, and that's why you can get all these granulations and. You can see uh, active region on the left, which is a little bit of a sol uh, sunspot. And you can also see prominences on the top and on the top right, which are like um, uh, like expulsions of gas, uh, ionized gas and plasma. So that is, this is like the sun you see in magazines and images, like a fiery ball of fire, not like a plain yellow disc you see at sunset. Yes. So that, that is why it was quite exciting for me. So many people don't realize that sun actually is not a solid ball. Uh, mm. It is a plasma. So yeah. it is very, very active at the surface. So yeah. um, like since it's very big, uh, it overall looks like a sphere. But uh, it there are chances that lo locally there are a lot of changes happening. Like mm. things are changing swiftly and so on. Yeah, even I took a time lapse, like a one hour time lapse. And you could see motion across the sun, like all, all the... The annulations were moving and new new prominences were moved, forming and stuff like that. So, sun is a very active body. Like, even in a few minutes, stuff can change. So, NASA also sent a uh, mm. Parker solar probe which went very close yeah. to the sun. Yeah, so it will, went to the corona of the sun. So, it will get to know that like, sun is like, there isn't a boundary. You can't, uh, like mm. on a rocky planet, you can land. But on mm. sun, most probably you can't do that. Yeah, it's a transition, and also the pressure, the gravity is so high that you will get crushed instantly. Yes, and, so you uh, have to maintain a velocity to stay in orbit. Otherwise, yeah. um, if you do something yeah. weird, then uh, gone, everything mm. is gone. Mm. Okay, this image is uh, one of the like most uh, fastest image you have captured, I guess. Yeah, the most uh, one of the most narrow windows of capture. This is uh, the mass occultation by the moon, which happened this year in April. So this was a quite a rare event because mostly the planets and the moon don't line up in the sky because they both are so small. But this time, 
Mars lined up exactly with the moon and moon passed in front of Mars and this was only visible to in some places in India and some places in Southeast Asia like Indonesia and Thailand mm -hmm. because uh, you had to be it had to be the right time so it was evening for India which was the perfect time to capture this and it only took a few seconds to emerge so I checked with an app and I saw which, what time exactly the mass will come out behind the moon and I saw which crater it will come out from because moon is very big like you can see in this photo moon is appearing almost flat yes. because this uh, it's so zoomed in that the curvature is so less that it appears almost flat try to match which crater the mass will come out from and I pointed my telescope at that crater and then suddenly mass came out and I quickly hit record and I took some frames and I stacked it to get this image so, so it yeah. was a uh, quite a good image for me and actually mass is very small in this image because mass opposition happened last year so it's quite far away from earth now that's why you can't see too much detail you can see a little bit of surface detail but uh, and you can see a little bit of the pole also the polar ice cap but uh, it's still visible so that's good so you had to study the hmm. moon's uh, position so which uh, crater it would uh, yeah be yeah, yeah I, I checked with my app and saw which crater from behind which crater it will come so i don't miss it because i yes. i was shooting at a very high focal length so I could get uh, the good zoom in from on Mars. That's and why. Overall, I think so. The astronomy and astrophotography uh, people are divided into two parts, right? The people who know the northern sky and the southern sky. Uh, yeah, the, in southern hemisphere, there's a lot of variety in objects. Like uh, you can see a lot of new objects which northern people can't see, but there are some common objects also that both people can see near the equator. Yes. So. And there are some northern objects that southern hemisphere people can't see. So there are advantages to both and disadvantages to both. We are coming now to this image, which you took from the southern hemisphere, uh, from New yeah. Zealand. So can yeah, you explain this, a bit about it? Yeah, so this image I took in 2019 in New Zealand. And it was the first time I photographed the Milky Way in the southern hemisphere. So this was visible with naked eye also because it was a dark sky. And you can see, uh, in this image, you can see a part of Milky Way that is never visible from India. So there is a Carina Nebula, which is a red nebula in the middle of the Milky Way. And oh, you can one. see the uh, the right, yeah, this one. And you can see uh, it's behind a tree in this image, but you can see the large Manglenic cloud on the left. Uh, uh, on the left, you can see, this yeah, a, this, yeah, one? yeah this one. Yeah, this okay. one, a little fuzzy. It's actually a large galaxy and it's a, it's a galaxy that's orbiting the Milky Way. And it's quite large in the sky and it's also visible with the naked eye, but only to the Southern Hemisphere people like uh like australia new zealand mostly well you can see a little bit from andaman and Nicobar Islands island also but it's very tough yes. so this galaxy i saw with the naked eye and you can see uh like there are a few other nebulas i don't know the name of but there is a certain pleiades uh and a few more nebulas and this is pointing south from new zealand so it's quite a south image and even then large magnetic cloud doesn't rise that much in the sky so if, if you go to Antarctica, you will be able to see it high in the sky. But from New Zealand also, it's a little uh, south. So, so it's the first time that you saw uh, get got to saw a large uh, magnetic yeah, yeah, cloud. Yeah, 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 with my naked eyes. Because, nice. and it appears like a cloud. It, it was named because like uh, early sailors, I think, which who they saw, uh, they saw this, they thought it was a small, two small clouds. So there's a large Manulanic cloud and small Manulanic cloud. Yes. So when I was watching it, I thought, wait, is that a cloud? And then I checked in my app and I saw it's actually a galaxy. Yes. So it appears like a cloud. Okay. Hmm. So now this is an image from the Northern Hemisphere taken from yeah. the city of Raj, uh, the uh, state, state of Rajasthan. Of Rajasthan, yeah. And so this was in uh, Javai, near Javai Dam. It's a dam in uh, Rajasthan near around 100 kilometers from Udaipur. And this was a quite a dark location. It was a bottle three sky, which is the darkest sky I've seen in India. Mm -hmm. And you could see Milky Way easily with naked eye. And I took some exposures. Uh, I like climbed a small hill and I took some exposures uh, with my tripod and camera. And I got this uh, image. So you can see uh, at the bottom there are a couple of tractors, which were like it was a farmland. So tractors were moving. So you can see mm -hmm. the headlights of the tractors uh, yeah, on the right see. side. The, okay. No, the bottom right, the, the ah, okay. illuminating the light, light, yeah, so these are tractors and uh, the city is in the distance also, little little light pollution, but it was still quite a good image. So, Bortel yeah. 3 is a measure to measure uh, the... Yeah, Bortel scale is a measurement of the light pollution, so Bortel 1 is the best, like excellent dark sky, Bortel 2 is the next, Bortel 3, 4, 
तो राइट नाउ आई लिव इन बॉटल एट सिटी विच इज ऑलमोस्ट द वर्स्ट द वर्स्ट विल बी बॉटल नाइन विच विल बी लाइक न्यू डेली और लाइक लार्ज सिटी इन मुंबई एंड बॉटल एट इज लाइक नेक्स्ट एंड देन लाइक रूरल स्काई इज अराउंड बॉटल फोर और फाइव लाइक स्मॉल विलेजेस स्मॉल टाउन सिक्स सेवन सो इट यू कैन यू कैन सी दिल्ली वे विद योर नेकेड आई फ्रॉम बॉटल फाइव और बिलो आई थिंक Like it depends on the 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 sky also, like clarity of the sky. Also, clarity as well. The amount of yeah, yeah. Of the a lot of factors, but as a rough guide, uh, Milky Way is good, nicely visible from bottle four, five, three, etc. Okay. And I think in India, the best place uh, for um, like viewing the night sky is uh, in Ladakh. Ladakh, yeah, Ladakh Le and Han Le, and yes. there's also oh. Spiti Valley. Spiti so there are few few high up higher places in the Himalayas with bottle one sky. and uh, there might be a couple of bottle one forests also in like chatisgarh and stuff but they, those are very remote like there no easy way to go there the easier way is to go to himalayas yes uh, going to a jungle mm. uh, to photograph the sky is yeah does, yeah doesn't seem like the best idea but yeah yeah and also at midnight so very unsafe and yeah, stuff yeah exactly and mm. And there is a chance that your uh, uh, 5000 dollar telescope might go into <laughs> a mud quicksand and you will never <laughs> yeah. recover it And no yeah, one will help you out because no one will enter the jungle. So a wild animals. Yeah. Okay. So now this uh, we are coming to mosaics. So this is one of mm. the um, nebulas that you have captured, and uh, it is over a period of two times. So can you explain? Yeah. This so th- this this uh, images of the North America nebula, which is on the left, you can see it's the shape of the continent of North America, and on the right, it's a pelican nebula. so i captured this object first time in 2020 late 2020 and uh, i took the my framing was only north america nebula so i captured that and then this year i captured the pelican nebula and then i after capturing i just saw that th- those are very close so i went in photoshop and i merged it and so it merged perfectly so you can see a wider shot of the whole area and you can see the black part in the middle is is actually a dark a dust cloud which is blocking the light from behind the nebula so it's actually it it's actually in front of the nebula and it's blocking the nebula completely that's why it's giving it the shape mm-hmm. and the mexico area in this is called the cygnus wall which is uh, yeah. yeah this area is cygnus wall Uh, and uh, the right one is the pelican nebula the right most part of this and uh, this, this is i think so interstellar dust na no? even if you yeah, inter- wait for one year the dust will still be there yeah 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 interstellar dust it's very large very slow moving and actually this nebula is being illuminated by the stars so nearby stars are in- illuminating the dust and that's why you can see it. so it's it's captured in two wavelengths hydrogen alpha and oxygen so the blue part is oxygen rich and the red part is hydrogen hydrogen rich Yes. So oxygen is rarer in space, so that's why uh, there's a less blue part and mo- mostly yes. it's red. So yeah. a lot of science goes into how elements are formed in space. Uh, most yeah. common are hydrogen and helium, mm. and uh, oxygen is uh, element um, eight, so it takes more mm. uh, fissions, uh, nuclear fissions, uh-huh. to reach that. And we even have gold and platinum forming, but that mm. also takes a lot of efforts. So to form gold and all that stuff, we need uh, very heavy objects like neutron stars mm. to make them. Mm. So that's very interesting. Okay, so um, next image is also a mosaic. So one yeah. question I have to ask before is how do you capture a such um, uh, like crisp image in um, uh, a night sky, which is a city, uh, Agra city? So how do you mm. capture such uh, crisp images? So from city, if you use like a normal camera and lens, and you point it at this, this is the Whale Nebula supernova remnant. And if you capture at this, you'll just see a white, white with no stars and no nebula, nothing, because the light pollution is so much that the sensor will get overwhelmed. So the faint light of the nebula won't reach the sensor because it will be overwhelmed by the noise, by the white noise of the city lights. So I used a narrow band filter, which is a filter which has a wavelength of seven nanometers, and it. rejects all the ex- extra light and it just lets the light in that 7 nanometer range pass through so that's why if you put that on a, if you put that to your eye you can't see through it because you it blocks almost all the light and if you put it on a monochrome camera which is a black and white camera so i use a black and white camera uh, to capture my images because it gives more sensitivity because in color camera there are three types of uh, receptors red green and blue And so one third, you get one third the sensitivity. Correct. Uh, in a monochrome camera, you get full sensitivity, and you can use colored filters in front of the camera to capture this. 
So I use the narrowband filters and in oxygen and hydrogen all again. So the, you can see a little bit of blue in, and the bottom one is Eastern Whale Nebula. And the top one is called uh, the Western Whale Nebula, also called the Witch's Broom. And the middle part is Pickering's Triangle, which is, uh, it, it's all part of the Cygnus uh, yeah, Supernova Remnant. Yeah, this is a Supernova Remnant. And yeah, this whole thing. are caused by one of the most explosive events and brightest events mm. in the sky called uh, supernovas. And supernovas mm. happen rarely, I think. They happen um, very few yeah. times in a galaxy uh, yeah. over our lifetime. Uh, so mm. they uh, are very hard to spot and they the remnants last for millions of years, right? So Yeah, like, like there's a nebula called the Crab Nebula, which is... Uh, right now you can see the crab nebula in the sky and it was caused by a supernova which happened in around 1000 years ago and Chinese astronomers have record of seeing that supernova with their naked eyes because it was very bright and then at that same place now you can today you can see the crab nebula so people yes. know that that came from a supernova. A crab nebula so, is one of the most heaviest hmm. studied objects. Uh, people use yeah. it a lot for even just proof of concept. So calibrate yeah. karna kuch, dekhna ki, uh, 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 sensor chalta hai ki nahi, look at crab uh, nebula. Person. And it's also M1, which is Messier 1, which is the yes. first object in the Messier list. Yeah, yes. So, a so lot of uh, things, catalogs to learn about mm, uh, mm. can't happen in this one video. So, we mm. move on to not uh, 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 nebulas, but to galaxies. So, mm. in this image captured by Shivam, uh, there are three galaxies visible. So, Shivam, mm. a bit about how yeah, uh, so we identify galaxies, how do we identify stars? So this is the Andromeda galaxy, which is probably the most famous galaxy because it's because of its large size and it's visible in the northern hemisphere, and it's also very close uh, to the Milky Way. It's the closest major galaxy to the Milky Way. It's even bigger than the Milky Way, and it will uh, collide with our galaxy in a few in a few billion years. So, which, and, uh, yeah. collide uh, is uh, I think so. People will get misguided. Uh, there is a lot of empty space between galaxies, so uh, our Earth will hundred uh, percent be safe. Yes. Yeah, but it will still the stars and the center of the galaxy will merge into a larger galaxy, I think. But uh, yeah, everything it, will be fine. Yeah, Overall, yeah. Uh, just the galaxy uh, will uh, have its own unified gravitational mm. uh, potential and all that. Uh, mm. Solar system will mostly be unaffected. But yeah. uh, it won't be existing also, which is another mm. thing to worry about. And uh, so this is the Andromeda galaxy and it was earlier it was known as the Andromeda Nebula because people saw the galaxy but they didn't know it was a galaxy, they thought it was a nebula. Okay. Then uh, then later it was discovered, I think Hub Edwin Hubble discovered that he, he studied the stars in the Andromeda galaxy and he realized they were very far away, like much farther than Milky Way galaxy. So they, he realized that it was a whole new galaxy. And the bottom right uh, elliptical thing is called uh, Messier 110, which is another dwarf galaxy. I think it's orbiting Andromeda. And the top, the this one, yeah, this one is called Messier 32, which is another galaxy orbiting Andromeda. And uh, you can see a little bit of red also in the Andromeda galaxy, which is I captured in hydrogen alpha. So they are some of the larger nebulas in in the Andromeda galaxy, yeah. Okay, so small so bits of red towards the uh, edge of the uh, galaxy spiral uh, arms we yeah. see a bit of reddish and that yeah. are just uh, hot gases not stars but uh, yeah gases illuminating being illuminated by stars because nebulas don't uh, emit their own light and visible spectrum yes. i think so and at the background we have stars right or galaxies or yeah stars all, all we never know uh, no no all stars because galaxies are so faint that in a 3 hour image they probably won't show up Yes. Like maybe there might be one or two tiny ones, but all stars. Correct. Craters. So crater yeah. imaging craters is much much harder because it's a very small part of the sky. I think less than one degree or something. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, moon is around half a degree in diameter, and this is a small part of the moon. So maybe a few couple of arc minutes in yes. diameter. So, so this is called the Clavius crater. It will be fast and moving, right? Yeah. You have to track it. Yeah, yeah. Actually, in deep sky also we have to track. So anything, moon, planets, deep sky, or nebulas, galaxies, you have to have a tracking mount which moves uh, with the sky because as the Earth rotates, everything rotates in the sky. And for this Clavius crater, I took around like 20,000 images uh, at a high frame rate, so around 50 frames per second for uh, 10 minutes or so to capture a lot of frames in, uh, because the thing with moon photography and planetary is there's a lot of atmospheric turbulence. So yes. if, if you take a hundred frames, one will be sharp and 99 will be uh, blurry. 
so you you capture a lot of frames and you find using software you you rank all the frames and you keep the first best 5% frames and you stack them to get this image then you sharpen it and then uh, edit it a bit and to make it even more sharp and then you get this final result which is the clavius crater which is uh, which was in the news recently because uh, nasa's sofia telescope discovered water in the sunlit part of the clavius, clavius crater so it was quite a final discovery and this crater is actually one of my favorites because i photographed this in 2016 also it was a blurry image but uh, it was one of the first craters i photographed and then i photographed it in 2020 also then 21 also and it was quite an improvement so i really like this crater it's around 100 kilometers in diameter okay and also uh, mm. stacking and uh, uh, removing uh, blurry frames of 20000 images yeah uh, so thank th god software exists otherwise <laughs> yeah we don't want uh, one person spending one whole year ki dekhe ki are ye thoda uh, blurry hai ye this one is not yeah blurry. Uh, there's an auto stack art software which uh, does this but in earlier times there were people who manually used to like do astronomy research they used to compare photographic plates to check if any star is moving you if you want to discover a planet you have to see if any star is moving in your image so you had to spend a lot of manpower a lot of man hours yeah. to hire thousand uh, interns mm. and tell them look at these photos mm. That, yeah. that photos will also be not uh, like mm. uh, it won't be digital photos so it will be mm. analog photos right Shiv? Mm. yeah oh, it will be much tougher okay now finally we are coming towards the end and this is a mm. mosaic uh, not a mosaic but a photo um, collage you can collage, say photo collage yeah. of all the objects you have captured over the uh, the pandemic time i must say last yeah. one and a half year so yeah in the solar system and this is, uh, this is just a reference image, like it's not for anything, all these things are not to scale, it's just a representation. So you can see the sun and the moon are roughly the same size in the sky. So those are the same and then from the top you can see Mercury which has a slight phase because it's the inner planet so it's not completely round. It's the lit side is on the right and Venus which shows, like moon it shows many phases and this is the crescent phase of Venus. Then instead of Earth, because I haven't been to space yet, I put in a space yeah. station. So uh, and then, I think so to uh, photograph Earth, uh, there are two ways. Either go to space or keep a giant mirror on moon and then see how yeah. the reflection is. <laughs> yeah. And maybe, or maybe put a hot uh, helium balloon with a camera and then let it fly. But still, but you, you won't get the full only, disk. Uh, the yeah. top part of yeah, the Yeah, horizon. Sky, but, uh, yeah, yeah. You, to get the full disk, you have to go to the halfway to the moon because okay. only Apollo astronauts could see the full Earth. Mostly and it will be one way ticket. Uh, it's now hot air balloon <laughs> if you are taking high. Most probably yeah. not coming back down. Uh, yeah, we know, actually helium balloon will go to around 30 kilometers high and then it will pop and then you can come back down. <laughs> and there's Mars and then there's uh, Jupiter, then Saturn and then Uranus and Neptune. And, uh, and you can see a prominence on the sun on the right which is like a it looks like a big fire erupting but actually plasma mm -hmm. and uh, the moon on the left and I've added a starry background just to uh, aesthetically pleasing to yes. make the image yes. but yeah so this is a collection of images and actually all these images have come a long way like uh, earlier when I took my first image of Mars it was just a red red circle with no detail and very small and Jupiter also same no real detail so there's a lot of scope for improvement still but uh, Right now my 8 inch scope is at its limit, like I need to make a, get a bigger scope 10 inch or 12 inch if I want to improve these images. Yes, so hmm. um, also uh, you need to go to uh, permanently to Ladakh. To, <laughs> yeah, to make yeah sure actually that... if you if you are at a mountain it's uh, good for planetary imaging because less atmosphere to image through. Mm -hmm. So that's why most observatories they put it on a mountain top. Yes. But it's a, mm. it's quite nice that India has such a mountainous region. Otherwise, we would have to go to like, uh, like mm. Chile or some southern hemisphere country. Yeah, like the countries like Maldives, their highest point is like fifty meters, so they have nothing. Uh, they, yeah, they, they have, have less very light pollution, countries. but they don't have uh, yeah. the elevation mm. to at least uh, have less mm. humidity, less atmosphere, mm. all that. Things. Yeah, deserts are best. Yes, deserts are best. Okay, now finally coming to uh, mm. the Christmas Nebula, which is uh, the latest one that you have captured, which also mm. got featured in Astrophotography India Instagram channel, mm. uh, Instagram page. Uh, so this does look like a Christmas tree. Uh, where yeah. exactly is this located and how this, is it so red? Uh, 
Uh, this is uh, located near the Orion constellation, uh, just left of the Rosette Nebula, which is another famous nebula. And this is uh, actually a Christmas tree cluster, and there are a few objects in it. So there is a Fox Fire Nebula inside this region, there is a Cone Nebula, uh, and uh, the whole thing is collectively known as Christmas tree cluster. And you can see uh, little young blue stars in the middle, which are forming. and. Uh, and the overall, it's it's a hydrogen-rich region. That's why it's so red because there's a lot of hydrogen gas. So I had around nine, eight eight to nine hours of exposure in this image, and I was photographing it because I wanted to get it ready in time for Christmas. So I posted it yesterday, and I started imaging it uh, this this month only in early December. So interesting, mm. yeah. Mm. So yes, finally, um, we will talk about Shivam's Instagram page. Uh, go and follow him. He is yeah. really good. Uh, one thing I would like to tell is um, photography uh, does require a lot of patience. So my question to Shivam is what exactly requires more patience? Is it um, like photographing birds, photographing mm. animals, photographing landscapes or is it astrophotography? Uh, so I think uh, there's a lot of scope in both, uh, especially bird photography and astrophotography. Because as for birds, it's easy to photograph uh, a bird, but it's tough to get a photo of a bird doing something unique. So you might have to sit for five hours if you want to see a bird uh, do something different or like pose in a certain way. And as for astrophotography, you can get an image in one hour also, you can get an image in ten hours also. So it's just up to you how much time you want to spend on it. So there's a lot of scope in both and it's just a matter of your goals like how much are you willing to spend on it how much are you interested in it uh, landscape photography i don't haven't done much but i think like weather might be a bit of a dependency on it and you might need the golden hour at sunset also yes, yes. Uh, but i think uh, bird photography and astrophotography are two of the long most time spent you you can do i think it's just the sunrise and sunset time when the entire um, Places uh, uniformly related. illuminated, so uniformly. Yeah, yeah. The golden hour, which is after sunrise and before sunset, it's the best for photography because the light is coming from an angle, so everything looks better. In the no, in a bright noon, everything is washed out, so not yes, too many colors. Too color. many reflections near the surface of the earth, so mm, there mm. can be. Okay, mm. and final question to Shivam is: um, James Webb Space Telescope took thirty years to develop. Finally, it is mm. launched. Six months mm. later, there will be images of it. So, Shivam, mm. will you be looking at those images and saying, Are, oh, this image, let me just verify and look with my uh, gear. <laughs> where, where yeah. I, I'll purchase can... the infrared sensor and verify this image. Yeah, I'm very excited to see the images, especially uh, seeing a direct image of uh, Proxima B, which is a planet orbiting Proxima Centauri, which is the nearest uh, red dwarf to Earth. And uh, the focal length on it is actually, I think, so high that I won't be able to do it. Do anything like I need a yeah. I need a few billion dollars more of a budget before or, or I can. You need a billion dollars for, uh, time of exposure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I need a billion year, billion years of exposure. And, Either uh, work. Also, super computing because the all yeah. the frames you have to stack it now. You can't give yeah. it to some person to do it. Yeah, so super computing. Yeah, I need, doing it. I need some super computer time and I need some super budget and then I'll be able to do it. Yeah, it's possible. So that's why. But James, actually, mm -hmm. actually, you can. If, if you have a good proposal, you can apply for telescope time also. Like there, even sometimes for Hubble people, amateur astronomers apply for telescope time and they submit a proposal. They want to do this experiment and then they can get a few hours to get some images done. So, so modern astronomers are not people who sit behind the telescope lens. Mostly they are mm. sitting in front of computers and they mm. uh, get some telescope time from various uh, uh, ground-based telescopes. Yeah, and they, they just, just analyze the data. data. Yeah. yeah, so mostly it's data analysis and I think after machine learning it will be a bit easier but still a lot of stuff humans have to do manually. So so that is right now the state of astronomy. But I think there's a lot of discoveries to be made because the James Webb Space Telescope is uh, three times the size of Hubble. Like the yes. mirror is so big and it's also in infrared so we'll be able to see further, in further back in time. Yes. So I'm quite excited to see. I hope it unfolds properly. It will take two weeks or something to reach its place in L2 Lagrange point yeah. and then uh, have to yesterday, unfold. Yesterday, a lot of people on Twitter and Facebook, uh, mm. astrophysicists, astronomer, they all were praying that uh, James Webb, please work. Yeah. They were, and like, he, because uh, there have been many missions, uh, like 
which are well planned but in uh, it's so uncertain and risky that even mm. one thing if it fails because this um, unfolding of motors is done by some processor and mm. if that processor uh, ke pass like if you just say that that processor doesn't function accurately mm. due to some various factors like um, mm. over voltage or some radiation coming on it then mm. it won't unfold and then mm. Uh, yeah and there is no room for repair also because it's going yeah, too far away millions of uh, yeah. 1.5 kilometer away. yeah 1.5 kil- million kilometers and uh, hubble was in low earth orbit so you could uh, t- you could go and repair it but in this it has to be perfect the first time and hubble was repaired five times and hubble yeah. was not operational for first two years i think no first yeah two. i think uh, for first three years and then 1993 it got the first mission to repair the sensor the mirror yeah. That's yeah. how uh, difficult it is to make uh, mm. sensors work mm. in high space, but it's important because we get to see images mm. which no one can capture. So that's important. from Earth. Yeah, from Earth, it atmosphere is in the way. So it's like trying to look through a glass window because there's so much atmosphere that real scientific data, like very high quality data, you can only get from space. Yeah, but many people they use concepts like adaptive optics uh, to mm. counteract the atmosphere. But then, then also mm. there is a lot of uh, and light pollution is there. Yeah, uncertainty is there. Okay, mm. so yeah, that uh, sums up the first uh, interview. There will be many more to come. There are a lot of astrophotographers in India. Um, mm. I'm not an astrophotographer. I am just an enthusiast. Uh, but yeah. First of all, check out Shivam Bansal's Instagram page and um, overall just uh, Astrophotography India and uh, all these communities that exist. Uh, and yeah, um, hope that uh, everyone gets uh, interested in astronomy because more people um, study the same object, the better it is, right, Shivam? Yeah, the interest in astronomy is, I think, only growing in India. And uh, I hope it continues to grow and more people are aware that lot of amazing things you can see if you just look up to the sky like people see the moon every day they just learn it about it in first or second class and then they forget about it but i think uh, learning about it and actually seeing with that with a telescope it's amazing experience yeah, so yeah is. i'm quite excited for the future especially some exciting astronomical events also coming up uh, next year there's a partial solar eclipse also in india in october yes. yeah so 2022 will be filled with a lot of things. So Shivam, just quickly, a new newcomer to astrophotography, which app mm. should he uh, he or she be referring to, and uh, what what should they be looking yes. at? Yeah. So I think tutorials on YouTube for for every every concept, and there are a few channels like uh, Astro Backyard, Nebula Photos, uh, etc., which show you how to start with just a basic camera and tripod. You can get good images. Then eventually you can start buying more equipment if you really, really want to get into it. But even with a manual camera, DSLR and tripod, you can get good images. And nowadays people are getting good images with their phone also. Like download an app which can control your exposure manually on your phone camera and you can capture Milky Way with your phone. So the equipment you mostly already have, it's just a matter of learning it and then doing it. And so also that's, lots of patience and yeah. a lot of sleepless nights. And lot of da- and you want to go to a dark sky if possible. If you live in a small city or if you live near a rural sky, it's very good. If you live in a big city, you just next time you go to a small city, you have to take your camera and see the night sky. Mm-hmm. And uh, there are apps on the phone also like Sky Safari, Sky Guide, in which you can see the real time planetarium software. You can see the real time position of the sky and, and uh, learn anywhere everything. Anywhere to measure. Suppose if I'm a, in a very small city uh, in Rajasthan. Mm-hmm. So hmm. anyway, I can measure if this is good enough, like Bortle yeah, 3, Bortle Yeah, they, there are websites like uh, Dark Sky Finder, Light Pollution Map, and just Google these names, Light Pollution Map, that Bortle Scale Finder, you will see a map and you can click on your city and it will show you which uh, Bortle class it is. But actually, uh, it's it, to an extent, it doesn't even matter Bortle class. You just have to go and outside and see it because that sometimes matters more. Bottle sky might be a bit wrong, but maps might not always be accurate because if there is a light in your neighbor's house which is very bright, your bottle scale will get to 10. Yeah. But if, if if power cut happens, your bottle scale will improve to 6. So yeah, that yeah, can yeah. happen. So it's best thing is to just, yeah. yeah, it's very variable. You just have to go out there and see it. Yes, a lot of mm. tries are needed. It's not like mm. first time you get everything correct. Yeah, yeah, it's a learning process. You have to learn from uh, every every mistake you do. You have to learn from it. Yes, sounds good. Okay. Mm. Yep. So that this sums up. Bye, Shivam. Have a great day and yeah, all the bye. viewers have a happy new year.
and uh, please uh, uh, yeah like shivam and yeah that's all like shivam's channel okay like like shivam and okay. like shivam's channel okay okay bye <laughs> okay bye